Brothers and sisters in Christ, good morning. Wow. Uh, allow me to read from a portion of Psalm chapter 27. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Indeed, even through all our experiences, through the good times, the bad times, even the worst of times, one thing is certain. Our God is still our God. And He is God Almighty. He is God over all. And because of that, we praise Him and we worship Him and we give Him our utmost. So why don't we all stand as we together Declare praises to our God this morning. Let us sing, Better is One Day. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. For my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence. I sing the shadow of your ways better is one day better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. Let's sing verse 2. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty. To find you in the place your glory dwells. One thing I ask, one thing I ask, and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you. Your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. The thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's water to my soul. 
sit in a scene Come once again to me I will draw near to you I will draw near to you Better is one than your voice Better is one than your house Better is one than your voice Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day. Better is one day. Better is one day. Than thousands elsewhere. Better is one. Father, we thank you for all the things that you have done for us. We thank you for your mighty work on the cross. We thank you for your love, your grace, even though we don't deserve it. And Father, even as we look back into creation, we see your mighty works and we see your glory over all. And because of that, Lord, we pray that we will be able to trust in you alone to be able to offer our lives to you. Father, we pray that even in the circumstances in our lives, that we will be able to fix our eyes on you to turn your eyes to you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We praise you and we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are gone I've been set free my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. One last time, let's sing together. Our God, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing Praise God for His wonderful grace. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in songs of praise and worship to our God. Welcome, everyone, to the second service. So last week, Pastor Jay Jackson uh, had his message entitled, uh, The Story That Changed Everything. So we heard about how Christ came to die for our sins, how he was buried, and how he rose again to save us. The beauty and power of the gospel is eternal. It has changed our lives, and it will change the lives of everyone who hears and believes. Before we continue, I would like to encourage everyone to kindly put your cell phones in silent mode. So thank you very much for uh, making our sanctuary a more dignified place. No? Now Pastor Elmer will lead us in the pastoral prayer. So let us all rise. Let's come to the Lord, Lord in prayer. We praise you, Father, our Lord. We will praise you with all our life. As long as we live, may your name be on our lips. You are the maker of all things, the heavens and the earth, and the sea and everything in them. You love us and brought us salvation. You also keep watch over us, guiding us wherever we go that your good news may be heard in all nations. Help us, Father, to be faithful in declaring your truth to all the people around us. We pray, Father, for our missionary who serves in Davao region, Pastor Herbert and Sister Amalia Ale. They have shared your good news to the people there. But as the majority of them are undergoing through the Ramadan this moment, may your spirit prompt their hearts of your truth. That those who heard of your gospel will see and realize that you are above all things. That they will learn to let go of their false belief. It will not be easy. That's why we ask for your Holy Spirit to be at work in them. That they will fully surrender to you. And at the same time, we pray for the ministry that they're having. 
that may you provide also for them as they plan to expand their student program next year to reach to more students. And may you bring these kids to them to be ministered to. Father, we also pray for the Tadayawan people group, the Mangyans, that as they worship nature spirits, they will be able to acknowledge you as the creator of all things and come to worship you instead of worshiping the things that you have created. We pray that the few believers there would have a hold of your word also, that they will be able to understand, learn, and, and know your word. And, be, and through that, they will also share your gospel to their own people. We pray for the people in Taiwan as they have suffered from a big earthquake just last Wednesday and people who have lost their loved ones or nowhere to go, that you will be the one to provide for them their shelter and receive comfort and that they will re recover from this uh, disaster. May your people also, the believers there, be able to engage in helping them, those who are in need, and they will have the opportunity to show your love and care for them through them. We also pray for our church, especially the Joshua Brigade, as they will be having their camp uh, this coming June, that as they prepare for it, uh, it the preparation will be smooth, that they will also be able to have the wisdom as to know how to train these boys up in your word and in discipline uh, in their truth. We also ask that through this camp, the boys will have the opportunity to know you and come to believe in you for who you really are. And we also pray for our young pros as they will also have the overnight glamping this month. We pray that for their safety and of course for their health and uh, that they will have a great time with you uh, in that place as they experience uh, the, the nature that you have created. And we pray that they will hear from you and know uh, what your desire is for their life as they live as a witness for you, uh, wherever they are, maybe in their work or in their family or yeah, uh, to, to their own places. Today, we leave our worship service into your hands. Prepare our hearts once again to hear your word. We pray for Reverend David Goh as he, to, to clearly deliver your truth and commands and we ask that your words will move us to glorify you even more in our lifetime. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture for today is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and 26 to 31. So let us read it together. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let us move now to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, heavens, and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth 
Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. That's be the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Our speaker for today is Reverend Dr. David Go, and his message is entitled, Glory. Afterwards, Reverend Alex will lead us in the communion and benediction. Last Sunday, it was uh, Easter Sunday. And so, all over the world, Christians, when they meet in churches, they, will, they, would, <clears throat> they would greet each other and say, uh, the Lord is risen. And uh, the response will be, He is risen indeed. That is a very, very nice tradition. A very, very meaningful one. We also did that here in church. And I, but I hope that uh, it will not just remain as a ritual, as a tradition in the church, but that uh, each one of us, we will always remember that we serve a risen Lord. And uh, because he is risen, we do not just proclaim his resurrection you know, in our mouth, but that we will let people see his resurrection power in our life, as well as in the circumstances that we meet. The Lord is indeed risen. <clears throat> By the way, before I preach, I would like to request uh, all of you to kindly pray for us tomorrow. Uh, 18 of us from this church, we are going to Davao uh, on a medical dental mission. And uh, we are going to three communities two of them would be muslim communities and uh, we know as many of you know davao is much much warmer uh, than manila so uh, kindly remember us uh, 18 of us and many of us are not young anymore so i'm not the only senior citizen there um, some are even older than, I, than me so kindly kindly remember us now, let me begin by asking the believers among us two questions. So if you think, if you believe that you are a believer, a Christian, uh, these questions are for you. Question number one. Okay. Uh, why did you accept Jesus and become a Christian. Why did you accept Jesus and become a Christian? You may have accepted Christ five minutes ago, five weeks ago, five years ago, 50 years ago. It doesn't matter, but why? What was your motivation? What was the reason behind your believing in Christ? Second question, why did you share, do you share the gospel if you are sharing? Or if not, why do you wish, why do you desire that, up, that other people come to Christ? I believe that Christians, all of you, would want your friends, your relatives to come to Christ. Some of us probably don't have the guts or you are not sharing the gospel, but deep in our hearts we wish that they will, that they will do so. Now, so what, what, what is the reason behind? Why, why do you want them to become, to become Christians? Now, I believe that all of you, you have your own answers, answers that are distinct, but yet, you know, answers that are unique, unique to your situation, unique to your understanding, unique to your experience. However, if we compare notes, we don't have time to compare notes today, chances are you will discover that more or less, we all have the same or similar answers. You see, when uh, people are asked these two questions, 
Hello. Generally, uh, we can find th these answers. Three general answers. Number one, people accept Christ or they share the gospel because they want a blessing. They want a blessing from God. They, you know, they want salvation. They want eternal life. They want forgiveness uh, for their sins. They want to enjoy a more meaningful life. Now, second, a lot of people share the gospel or accept Christ because they need a change or they think that other people need a change. A change probably in their behavior, a change you know, in their life situation, a, a change you know, in the way they relate to others, to one another. And uh, thirdly, people b believe in Jesus and share the gospel because they want a spiritual experience. They want peace in their hearts. They want to know God. They want to have connection with, you know, some powers above. They want to belong to a spiritual community. A professor at Harvard, he made a research. He surveyed many people and uh, in his book, he concluded and he wrote this. People believe in Jesus mainly for three reasons. Number one, they want, you know, uh, to belong to a community, a community that is better, a community that is superior, you know, to the one that they, that they already have or that they belong to. Secondly, a lot of people, you know, they believe in Jesus or they share the gospel because they want to receive the gifts that the church promises. We all know that the church promise, promises a lot uh, of, of gifts, gift of eternal life, abundant life, gift of love, you know, um, you know, even material gifts or supernatural and spiritual gifts. And then thirdly, people believe in Jesus because they want to be connected to the powers beyond this world. So if you look at these three answers and compared to the ones that I mentioned earlier, you'll see more or less they are the same. You know, in the 16th century, there was a uh, Spanish theologian by the name of Hurtado. Hurtado also made a research and he wrote a book. And he said that people become Christians, number one, because they want to belong to a unique social project. Meaning to say, they want to belong to a special community. A community, you know, that is strict, you know, disciplined, but yet kind. A community that is diverse, but yet united. A community that stands for truth. A community that is against the evils of the world. And secondly, people believe in, in Jesus because they want to benefit. They want to profit, you know, from the generosity of Christians. Christians are perceived, you know, to be generous with their money, with their time, you know, with their, with their, with their resources. They are perceived to be fair, you know, to one another. I hope that that is really true. But at least that is the perception. They perceive that Christians treat people fairly and, and equally. And uh, not only that, Christians offer the free gift of eternal life. So a lot of people want to believe in Jesus because of that. And then thirdly, he said that people believe in Jesus because they want to have a personal and loving relationship, you know, with the God of the Christians. In the other religions that they belong to, the gods that they worship are gods who give favor when you are good, but punishes you when you are bad. And after that, nothing else. There's no personal relationship. However, they have discovered that in the Christ, among the Christians, the God that they worship is a God that can and, have, and want to have a personal relationship with them. So again, if you look at all of this, you will discover that the reasons, more or less, are the same. 
whether now, whether in the 16th century or even before. You know, people come to Christ, they share the gospel because of practically the same reasons. Now, all of these reasons, we have to admit, they are good, they are very reasonable, they are very sensible. sensible. In fact, they are very pragmatic, very, very practical. However, let me ask you, are these reasons the finest reasons that we can give for coming to Christ? Are these the best reasons for us, you know, to share the gospel? Is getting saved, getting blessed, getting more spiritual, you know, the bottom line reasons, you know, why we should become Christians or why people should become Christians? Now, this morning, we are starting a new series of study, studies, and uh, this is called The Gospel According to Genesis. So, between now and the next several weeks, we will be looking at the book of Genesis. And uh, particularly this morning, we are going to look at the first two chapters of Genesis. Don't worry, you still have your lunch. We are not going to look through every verse of these two chapters. I just want to highlight some of the verses here and some of the truths from these uh, two passages. And the reason why I want us to look at this is because from here, it is my hope that we will be able to see and to understand the ultimate reason why we should be believe in Jesus. The ultimate, the best, the finest reason why we should share the gospel and why people should believe in Christ. Now, to begin our study, allow me to share with you a story from one of our mission fields in India. As many of you know, I, I go to India uh, quite, uh, quite often, and I've heard a lot of stories, and this one I, I like very much. Alicia, not her real name. Alicia, you know, was a Muslim. She was raised, she was, she was born, she was raised in a Muslim family. She also married a Muslim husband. She's a farm worker. And not long ago, while she was working in the field, a poisonous snake bit her. And when her colleagues saw that, they immediately, you know, uh, took her to a clinic nearby. Sad to say, the clinic does not have the facilities nor the medicines, you know, to help her. So they referred her and, and sent her to another hospital four hours away. By the time that they, they got to the hospital, she was already extremely weak. She had already deteriorated badly. But still, the hospital tried to help her. Not just that day, but in the next several days. However, all their efforts, you know, were in vain. So the hospital, you know, just dismissed her. They gave up on her. So the family took her and then brought her to the mosque in the hope that the imams, you know, the ustads, they could pray and they could perform rituals for her healing. And they did, but nothing happened. So they, they again took her out of the mosque and took her to different Hindu temples. They were not Hindus, but you know, there were many Hindu temples. They, they took, took her to Hindu temples again in the hope you know, that the priests, that the people there can pray over and to help her. Nothing, nothing happened. In the meantime, there was a, a Christian missionary who lived in another village nearby. When she learned, when she heard about this woman, she traveled to the village and visited her. She prayed for her, she preached the gospel to her and to the entire family. By the grace of God, that day, there was some improvements. She was able to talk and her strength, you know, regained. She regained her strength. And in the next several days, this 
missionary come back again and again to pray for her, to minister to her, and, and to help her. And again, God is so miraculous. She became completely well. As a result, this woman, the entire family, accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But that is not the end of the story. When the community people, the village people who were mostly Hindus, they had never heard of Jesus Christ before. The gospel had never been preached in their, in their village before. When they heard this story, all of them gave glory to God, the God of the Christians. And eventually, many of them also gave their lives to Jesus. And today, in this village, they have a Christian church that is growing, and many are coming to Jesus Christ. Now, why am I telling you this story? Well, obviously, one of the reasons is to let you know, to remind you that the God we serve is a living God, that he is mighty to save, that he is mighty, you know, to help us. If you have problems, you know, whatever they are, you can bring it to him and he can help you. However, more than that, I tell you this story because I want to help you understand that the ultimate objective, the ultimate reason why we need to believe in Christ, why we need to share the gospel is this, the glory of God. We need to share the gospel, we need to believe in Jesus Christ because of the glory of Christ. You have to understand that the gospel actually is not about us. It is about God. It is about His glory. Yes, we benefit a lot if we believe in Christ. Yes, our un unsaved relatives, if they come to Christ, they do receive a lot of blessings. But those are not the ultimate reasons why we should share the gospel, why we should believe in Christ. The gospel is about the glory of God. It is about God saving souls to bring glory to his name. It is about God changing lives and uh, restoring his glorious image in us. We, human beings, we were created in the image of God. Unfortunately, sin had destroyed and marred, you know, that image. So when a person comes to Christ, his life is, his life is changed, the glory of God, you know, is once again, you know, uh, bestowed upon him. Through his transformed life, through the relationship that was broken and will be restored, God is going to be glorified. <clears throat> you see, if we study the creation story, which we are going to do in a short while, you will discover that God's glory is painted all over. God's glory is seen all over. First of all, in Genesis chapter 1, we will see this very obvious truth. God, our creator, is extremely glorious and magnificent. God, our creator, is extremely magnificent. We and everything else in this universe, we were created by a God who is not just mighty and powerful, but he is a God who is extremely beautiful, magnificent, awesome, amazing. We did not come to existence because of evolution. The universe, you know, did not come to existence because of an accident, a big bang. No, we were created by a God who is almighty, all-powerful, and amazingly glorious and beautiful. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is a verse that is familiar to all of us. And 
our Bible begins with this verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want you to understand that the word God that was used is the word Elohim. In the Bible, as all of us know, God has many names. But in this particular verse, Elohim was used. Now, why is this so? Why not some other names? Why this name? What is so special about this name? Well, let me tell you. There are at least four reasons. You see, Elohim has four basic meanings or connotations. When the word, when the name Elohim is used in the Bible, you know, it is used to convey one or all of this. Number one, Elohim means the one and only true God. So when the Bible was telling the creation story, the Bible tells us that everything, you and I and everything around, is create, created by the one and only true God of the universe. It is not created by Brahma, as the Hindus would believe. It is not, you know, created, you know, by Ra, yeah, or, or Atum, you know, as the Egyptians would believe. It is not created by Phanes, as the Greeks would believe. But it is created by Elohim, the one and only true God. There are many so-called gods in this world, but, you know, this universe is created by him, the one and only true God. And secondly, Elohim means the divine and holy God. The other gods that people worship are created by human beings. They are formed, they are sculpted, you know, they are made by, by human hands. However, Elohim, the God, the one and only true God, is a self-existent God. From eternity past to eternity future, He is there. No one created Him. He is not a created being, but he is a divine God, you know, a deity. And he is a holy God. A holy God means a God that is above all, a God that is superior, distinctly different from all the other gods. And then Elohim means the great and mighty God, the powerful God who rules, the sovereign God who rules. So, the creation story is telling us that God did not just create us and then leave us alone because some people believe that. God created everything and then, you know, let the world run its own course. No, no, no. He is a mighty God who did not only create us but sustain us. So everything is created and sustained by Him. And then this one I, is the one I want to emphasize. Elohim. Elohim means the exceedingly glorious God. The extremely glorious God. So God is not just almighty, all-powerful, but He is exceedingly, exceedingly beautiful, exceedingly glorious. So brothers and sisters, I hope that we will understand what the Bible is try trying to tell us. The universe everything, including you and me. We are created by a God who is almighty, but a God who is glorious and exceedingly beautiful. Because of that, we need to share the gospel. Because of that, we need, you know, to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior so that we can be connected, we can be related to this glorious God who created us, and then when we have sinned, he even extended his hand, you know, to restore us, to accept us. What a wonderful God we have. You know, King David, he understood the glory of God. That is why in Psalm 27, verse 4, I love this verse. He said, one thing, one thing I ask from the Lord, and this only I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to seek 
Him in His temple. I want to see God in all of His beauty. Our God is a glorious God. And that is why Asap, Asap, you know, was one of the worship leaders of the Old Testament, a great composer. And he said, the mighty one, the Lord who speaks and summons, you know, the sovereign Lord who summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting, he is perfect in beauty. Glorious, wonderful, awesome, beautiful. And precisely because of that, you know, when Isaiah was prophesying about the second coming of Christ, he said, on that day when we see Christ, in that day the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty. Why do we accept Christ? Because the glorious God who created us is now extending, you know, his love, his hands to us. We have been running away from him. Sin has destroyed, you know, our relationship with him. And now this glorious God is calling us back. If you look at the story, the creation story, this is another thing that you'll discover. Everything that he created was exceedingly good or very good. I like, I like it when, uh, when uh, Dr. Zebedee was reading. He emphasized the word very good. Yes. God said everything was very good. Everything that he created was exceedingly good and glorious as well. I, I know that many of you, you use the, you're using the online our daily bread I, I know that my only warning is don't just read the daily bread read the bible I, I know that some people they just read the story that story is only to guide us but anyway if you are reading if you are using the daily bread i'm sure you still remember you know the the story that was told by Sochil Dixon, Dixon. Uh, just recently. When her son was three years old, she brought her to, you know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And when they entered the hall, the boy looked up and there was this replica, huge replica of a hunchback whale. Immediately, the boy said, enormous. Uh, later on, they came before, you know, a big, big aquarium, aquarium window. And the boy saw jellyfish, golden brown, you know, dancing, moving around in the blue, clear water. And the mother said, you know, God created all of this just as he created you and me. And the boy said, wow. Now, why, why did the boy respond in this way? Wow. Awesome. It's all because everything that he saw, everything that God has created was gloriously good. It was beautiful. You know, the, the response of the boy reminds me of my own response every time. I'm not exaggerating. Every time that I see the sunset at Manila Bay. Wow. I'm sure that many of you also have that experience. His response reminds me of the very first time that I saw the Niagara Falls, you know, in New York. I know, I, what I saw was the Niagara Falls from the New York side. Some people said, if you are in Canada, that the site would be even more awesome. But I remember when I first saw the Niagara Falls, I said, wow. The response of the boy also reminded me. There was once, you know, we, we were at, uh, in Monterey again. And uh, we, were, we parked our car and we were walking, you know, to see the waterfalls. There were many waterfalls. We were very far away. I just heard the splash. And I said, wow. 
And then later on, when we were nearer, 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 you know, I, I felt the, the breeze, you know, the sprinkles of the, of the waterfall. I said, wow. Wow. Because creation is amazingly beautiful. Now, if we look at the creation story, obviously, obviously there are so many things, so, so, very, so many wonderful things that we can see. But, but I want to highlight two things. The first thing I want to highlight is this. If you look at the creation story, you discover that the first thing God created was light. Now, I want you to understand something. God created light not merely to dissipate darkness. That was part of the reason. But God created light in order to reflect and to sprinkle his beauty on this creation. <coughs> now, how do we know that? We will know that if we look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. In verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void at the beginning. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. Now, I want you to pay attention. I want you to use your imagination. There is this stark difference. There is darkness and chaos and void down there. But the spirit of the glorious God was hovering there. Next verse, an emphatic verse. It says, and God said, let there be light. If you go to the Hebrew Bible, and God said means as a result, as a result of the preceding verse, as a result of the stark dark, uh, contrast between these two, God said, let there be light. And because of that, God saw that the light was good. So what is all this telling us? It is all telling us that when God created light, one of his intentions, you know, was to shower the world with his beauty, with his glory. The spirit of the living God, the glorious God, phew, and then everything became good. Now, the second thing I want to highlight is this. Not only was light good, but everything that God created was good. You all know the <clears throat> creation story. God created the, the universe how many days? How many days? Now, I asked that question. That is a trick question. Because many people will say seven. No, no, no. He did not create the universe in seven days, just six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Now, in those six days, the Lord created many things. If we read the creation story, you'll discover that God, after he created the things that he wanted every day, at the end of each day, he would say, it was good. It was good. What I created, this thing, that thing, all of this is good. Now, take note that the word good has at least three meanings. Number one, good means everything that God has created was beautiful, pleasant to the eye. Everything is pleasant, pleasurable, you know, if you look at, if you look at it. No wonder the boy said, wow. No wonder, you know, when we see the sunset, we say, wow. The second meaning is everything that God created was agreeable, was agreeable to him. In other words, it was satisfying to him. When God saw all of this, he was satisfied. He was contented. It was agreeable to him. It was good to him. And then the third meaning is everything that God had created matches his nature, his glorious nature. 
it meets his standard. So here, what is the Bible telling us? The Bible is telling us that everything that God has created, you know, was not just beautiful, was not just pleasant, but it is glorious. That is why at the end of the six days, God said everything is exceedingly good. Very, very good. Now, can you imagine that? The exceedingly glorious, magnificent God made a universe that is exceedingly awesome and stunning. I, I hope that this statement hits you. If it does not hit, gets through your thick skull, I hope you will take a few moments to meditate on this. Go ahead. I will give you a few seconds. The exceedingly glorious and magnificent God, he made a universe that is exceedingly awesome and stunning. Wow. If you look at the creation story, there's a third thing that we can learn. God created man, you and I, men and women, human beings, in his glorious image and in his likeness. <clears throat> On the sixth and final day, God created man. You know, from here we can see how wise, you know, how, how, how beautiful our God is. Just imagine this. He did not create man on the first day. Gugutominian. First day, everything was void. But God created man on the sixth day. He prepared everything for man. He loves man that much. Man is the, you know, cream of the crop, the crown of his glory. So on the sixth day, he created man. And I want you to pay attention if you read the creation story, you will see that God created man in extraordinary and supreme fashion. Let me just very quickly run through this. If you look, look at the first <coughs> part of verse 7 in chapter 2, he formed man with his own hands. When he was creating the other things, he just used his mouth. Let there be light. Let there be the birds let there be what? But now when he created man, he took dust from the earth and he formed it with his hand. We are special. And then he breathed his life into man. You know, in the original Bible, it says he breathed his spirit into man. Because of that, we are not just, you know, a physical body. We are not just a physical being, but we are also a spiritual being because the Spirit of God was breathed into us. As a result, man become, became a living creature. Again, if you go to the original Bible, the word that was used is nefesh. Nefesh means a soul. So he became a creature with a soul. So man is completely unique, completely different you know, from, from the other cre creature, crea creatures. We are physical, we have a physical body, we have a spirit, and we have a soul. You know, I, I, I know of some people, even Christians, they love their dogs and their cats so much. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I hope that I don't offend anyone by saying this, but I know that many people uh, love their dogs and cats. Well and good. I admire you. Continue to do so. Just don't worship them. But I know of some people, even Christians, they worship their dogs and cats so much, they said one day in heaven, they're going to see their cats and dogs again. I, I don't see that in the, in the Bible. Cats and dogs, they don't have souls. They don't have spirit. They don't have the spirit of God in them. So they are not going to be with God eternally. They only have a physical body. But we, we have a physical body, we have a spirit, we have a soul. We are really, really 
wonderfully created. And the Bible also said, we are created in his own image, in his own, <clears throat> in his own likeness. Now, now, what does that mean? Well, it could mean a lot of things. However, the most basic meaning, according to John Piper, John Piper said, the basic meaning of this is that we are created with the glory of God. We are created in the glory of God. We are created to reflect the glory of God. And he went on to say, if you create something, if you make a sculpture of someone, you do it to display something about that person. You want people to look at it, to notice it, to think about their pers that person and think of something positive about them. And so he said, God created us glorious so that we will reflect his glory so that other people or other creatures look at us, who oh, they would also say, wow. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you this question. When your neighbors see you, do they say, wow? I really hope so. Wow. Itong Kristiano na to, ibang klase to. Or do they say, hmm. We are created in the glorious image of God. And then the Bible said he placed man, among other things, he placed man in the Garden of Eden. Why? The Bible said to take care of his creation. Secondly, he, he placed Adam and Eve in the garden so that they could enjoy his creation. That's why they are allowed to eat of the fruit of every tree except one. So, you know, they can just eat as much as they like, as much as they want. Buffet every day. And then thirdly, man was placed in the Garden of Eden to enjoy his glorious presence and to have a glad and loving relationship with him. How do we know that? Some of you may say, Boksu, I read Genesis 1 and 2. I, I did not see that. Yes, it is not explicitly said in Genesis 1 and 2. However, if you go to Genesis chapter 3, there is this hint showing us, telling us that that was one of the purposes. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, what was the first thing that God did? God came down, he walked on the garden, chapter 3 tells, tells us, and he asked the question, where are you? Where are you? Now, the hint here is this. God and Adam and Eve had been in the habit of walking around the garden, talking with each other, having a good relationship a good fellowship with one another. However, because of sin, Adam and Eve hid. So God said, where are you? you were, we are supposed to have a date, but you are missing. In Indian mo ako. Can, can you just imagine that? We you and me, and all the other human beings around us, each one of us, we are created in God's glorious image. And the bottom line is so that we can have a glad and loving relationship with him, to enjoy the presence of God in our life. Unfortunately, just like Adam and Eve, we have all sinned. Just like Adam and Eve, Many of us, we are hiding, in fact, running away from God. We are so embarrassed with our own sin. We know that we are unworthy to be, you know, with this holy and glorious God. So we run. And not only that, because of sin, sin has destroyed 
that good relationship that we have with God, sin has blinded us to the way back to God. Sin has also destroyed the glorious image of God in us. That is why when I ask you the question, when your neighbor looks at you, not many of them would say, wow. Why? Not because you are not handsome or not pretty, but because we are marred by sin. We all live with our sinful nature. We have our sinful habits. Although we know that it's wrong to sin, but we continue to sin left and right. Because of that, because of that, we need Jesus Christ. Because of that, we need to share the gospel because the gospel is about the glorious God coming over, extending his hand, and winning us back so that we can be, will be able to enjoy his presence and be in his glorious presence all over again so that we can reflect his glory again. So that when we are transformed in Christ, when our sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit give us the power to win over sin, people would say, wow, just as they would if they, if they see God. So what is the ultimate, ultimate lesson or reason <clears throat> why we believe in God, believe in Jesus, and why we share the gospel? It's all about God's glory. We believe in Jesus and we share the gospel so that God's glorious image will be restored in human beings, in you, in me, in our relatives, <clears throat> in our loved ones. Not just so that they will go to heaven. That is just a bonus, a friend's benefit. But the real bottom line is so that God's glorious image will be reflected in God's. We receive Jesus and share the gospel so that the broken relationship of man with God will be restored. God is a glorious God, but now we don't see his glory. But through Jesus Christ, we will be able to restore a relationship with him and see him in all his glory. One more thing. When our lives are transformed, we become a new creation and God will be glorified. We may be a drunkard before. When we become a Christian, the Lord changes us, and people say, wow, what happened to you? Before we become a Christian, maybe we curse left and right. But now, it's all praise the Lord. And people say, wow. Through our transformation, people will bring glory to God. Just as what had happened, you know, in that village in India, when Alicia became a Christian, you know, and, his, and her illness was healed. So right now, I want all of you to just respond to God and pray to him. If any of you have not yet received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right now, I hope that you understand what the gospel is. The gospel is not just changing your religion. It is certainly not about changing your religion. It is about receiving the God of glory into our lives so that we can once again be a glory, glorious creature. Pray to God. Worship him. Father God, we truly want to worship you. You are so awesome, wonderful, powerful, and glorious. But the most wonderful thing of all is that when we sin, your love found a way, and you prepared your son, you sent your son to this earth in order to die for our sins, to restore our relationship with you, to restore our image 
of glory and beauty to restore our relationship so that we can enjoy your presence each day. Father, continue to speak to us. Enable us to continue to worship you and to trust you and to share the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord as we have our time of communion. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. 